You're listening to the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast presented by Krauss Health, the exclusive healthcare partner of Syracuse Athletics. Welcome back to another edition of the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast as we can uh, continue our series of interviews leading up to Saturday, February 24th at the JMA Wireless Dome where Syracuse University is going to honor the career of former SU coach Jim Beheim, And we're talking to folks that kind of span the arc of Coach Beheim's time here at Syracuse University. And today we got one of the all-time greats, ladies and gentlemen, Lawrence Poetry in Motion. Uh, how you doing, Lawrence? Good to see you, man. Yeah, I'm doing fine, Mike. Thanks for having me on. And uh, it's always good to see you because, like I just told you, you know, I feel like we came in together. Yeah, really did. I mean, uh, I was still – a wet behind the ears reporter when you uh, hit the campus back then. And uh, it was a heady time, a, a real interesting time actually in, in the history of Syracuse basketball. And I want to delve into some of that with you as we get going here, but let's start it off with kind of a really broad question for you about coach Beheim. When you think back about him, this maybe in terms of your playing years, if you think about him as a coach, what really stands out to you in terms of his qualities as a coach? Well, one of the qualities I can say that stood out with me with Coach Beheim is, you know, that uh, he might not look like it, but he's definitely, a, a, I call it an undercover motivator. You know, a lot of people would, you know, kind of get it misconstrued or twisted when they would see him yelling and real fiery and, 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 and telling off the refs and everything, but that was his passion and, and his way of showing how much he loved the game and, and his knowledge of the game. He, he, he's coached for 47 years and done great things here for this university and not only the university, um, college basketball in general. Mm -hmm. um, when you say his name, it will never be forgotten. You came to Syracuse a really interesting time. Uh, you come out of, out of D.C., Archbishop Carroll High School, and you actually had to take one year at prep school up at New Hampton. Yes. What did Coach Beheim tell you about, you know, the year you were going to spend there? Or, you know, how much contact did he maintain with you? And what kind of advice did he give you uh, during that year you spent at New Hampton before coming to SU? Yeah. Well, it wasn't, if anything, it was more of a Lawrence, um, do what you have to do. Um, and once you come up here you, you make sure you just take care of business because a lot of people don't know um I could have came to Syracuse but I would have had to sit out mm -hmm. they wanted me to come but me personally I didn't want to lose four years Mike mm -hmm. I didn't want to lose four years so I, I went to the prep school and honed my skills got to play a little bit more football my passion one of my other passions and uh went up to New Hampton prep I had two great coaches Mark Tilton and Whitler Shore were very good men and I had great teammates, Conzo Martin, head coach, you know, Conzo Martin and uh, Kenya Hunter, who's assistant coach at Indiana. Those were my teammates. So wow. Um, wow. yeah, we, 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 we were up there and we had to take care of business because, you know, at that time, you know, um, prep school wasn't a thing, wasn't yeah. like a yeah. thing. And it was something that you were, you, you know, you were jumping out there and just, giving it your all as far as how you feel. And and I felt that um I definitely didn't want to sit out. It would have been torture to come to Syracuse and sit for a year and, and watch and wait and all that. So I just went to prep school, handled my business. And when the time came, I came up here and did what I had to do. You know, it's one thing that you decided to go to Hampton and all that, but the fact that you did play football up there, what was Coach Beheim's reaction to that when he <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was an eerie feeling from him and Coach Wayne Morgan. <laughs> they were they kind of tried to sway me out of it, you know, especially uh Coach Morgan, you know, he kind of sway tried to sway me out of it. But I love football. Football was my first love. And and it kind of made the year go by faster up there in New Hampshire. I think if I would have just sat there and waited till basketball season, it would have made it a little bit more difficult with that and schoolwork. So you know, I was like football, school, now I'm going into the basketball season. So I had a lot of things to stay focused on and, and, and I honed my skills and I had great teammates up there who 
who helped me um, not only be a, a, a good player, but a good teammate and, and a good person. This is my first time leaving Washington, D.C. And, and dealing with a whole different culture. And I was able to do that. And uh, I was ready. You know, I was always standing in contact with the uh, Cuse Nation anyway because Marvin Graves was my uh, high school teammate and he was the quarterback, star quarterback at Syracuse. So he would always call me and we would talk and I would ask him what's going on. And, you know, he was like, they can't wait to get you up here and everything. So uh, uh, he, he kept me in the loop. You know, that year you spent in New Hampton, it's the 1990-91 academic year, school year. Down here in Syracuse, the NCAA investigation into the basketball program is, is taking place. Yes. And I was wondering, how much were you hearing about that? And what were what was Coach Beheim telling you in terms of, you know, just letting you know what was going on? Because this could impact your decision, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it was a lot uh, to think about, you know. But a lot of people don't know this story, Mike. And I'm going to go a little bit off track. A lot of people don't know I signed with the University of Maryland. I was going to Maryland University. You signed? I, I had signed a letter of intent to go to the University of Maryland. Me and Donya Marshall, we had signed, yes. i never forget it. The Washington Post had the Eminem boys signed for Maryland. Two days later, I get a call from the academic advisor, um, Peter Sawyer, great man. And he was crying. He was crying like like death. I never forget it. I'm like, Peter, what's going on? And he's like, just crying. This is not fair. This is not fair. I'm like, what's wrong? So they're not accepting you and Danielle Marshall because they're saying your 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 GPAs wasn't high enough. And at the time, I had like a two two seven, two six. You know, I was I was a solid student, C plus, B minus guy. And um, they decided to go. Um, in another direction, and a lot of people don't understand, Maryland University was going through their probation thing too. So, you know, uh, Bob Wade had just got fired, and it was Gary Williams' first year. I had signed the letter of intent to go to Maryland, but two days later, uh, they denied it. And I remember reading the Washington Post, the Eminem boys denied. Moten and Marshall denied. So it's funny how things work out. You know, I tell people all the time, like, uh, God makes no mistakes. It was a situation that I think was the best thing for me because um, being a high school All-American in both sports in your, from, from D.C., D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, you know, uh, I look at it like if I would have went to Maryland, I would have had to try to please too many people and get all these tickets and instead of staying focused. And I came up to Syracuse, you know, which is a six-hour drive, hour flight, and I was more focused here. And I had a roommate who I knew in high school who kept me focused also. So uh, I decided uh, to come to Syracuse, you know, uh, and, and um, the rest is history. So that situation in Maryland, was that while you were still at Archbishop Carroll or uh, and, yes. and Arch Arch before Arch you went to New Hampton? This was Archbishop Carroll before I went to New Hampton. Yes. Yes. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people don't know that. I, I've told that story many a times, but can you imagine? I was telling you, you know, it's funny how it works because, you know, I have some great accolades here, and I know Danielle Marshall have ha, has great accolades in, in Connecticut. And we both would have been teammates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Gary Williams might have won the national title before he did in, in the early 2000s. Oh, oh, oh ain't no question. With yeah, Ron been, Dixon and those guys. Yes, me, Joe Smith, X-Ray Hip, Johnny Rhodes, and Danielle Marshall. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it would have been it would have been a nice nice Terp team, and you know, um, I was just home in Washington D.C. this past weekend for Valentine's Day, and I went to the Maryland Illinois game Saturday, and uh, still to this day, uh, some of the fans were like, "Man, you should have you you sh it should I, I we just wish it would have worked out here." And I just told them, <laughs> you know, everything happens for a reason. So you know, my cousin is assistant coach for Maryland University men's basketball. Who's that? So, David Cox. Yes. Oh, sure. Yeah, he was the head coach at Rhode Island. I yeah. didn't know he was your cousin. Yeah, that's family. That's family. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so then after that situation, then Syracuse got more heavily involved? Yeah, more heavily involved. I was, like I said, talking to Marvin consistently, and, you know, they, 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 they want you, man. Come on up. I took my visit 
up to Syracuse and just so happened they did one of the best things that they could have done as a university. They they had uh, Billy Owens as my chaperone and he was my favorite player. <laughs> and, 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 you know, they took me around and of course I had Marvin, but, but Billy Owens was my guy. And it's funny how things work, Mike. Right now he's the godfather of my kids and, and I'm the godfather of his, of Chaz. So it's funny, his 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 wife and my my wife were roommates. Oh my God. Yes, 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 yes. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you're, a lot of people re remember you starting as a freshman. You had a great freshman year, but you didn't start from day one. Nope. Your first third start game. comes in, third game. Third, third game, game of the season. I had to go back and look it up. Um, my memory's a little fuzzy at this point. Florida okay. State in Atlanta. Yes. How yes. did Coach Beheim let you know he was moving you into the starting lineup for that game? And that's the thing about you got to you gotta either love or hate about Coach Beheim is he doesn't let you know. You know, I found out when I walked in the locker room and I saw my name diagrammed on the board, starting five and who you would be checking. And uh, it's funny, it's, it's, it's all coming to fruition, Mike, because I this – Saturday, I just saw Sam Cassell, and and me and him was talking, and he was like, he remembered the game like it was yesterday. He was like, man, I just want to let you know, I couldn't believe a freshman killed me like that. You know, I was like, Sam, it wasn't only you. It was a team game. But back to that, I see my name on the board uh, as the starting five. In the starting five, coach will give you about 10 or 15 minutes to uh, – go on your own and mentally get focused. And and I remember the first thing I did, I left the locker room, Mike, and I went looking for a pay phone. We didn't have cell phones back then. So I went looking for a pay phone and I, I made a collect call and it was to my mother. Uh -huh. This was a TV game, ESPN game. And I, I never forget calling and collect and they accepted the collect. And I said, mom, I'm starting. And she screamed so loud. Oh baby, I'm so happy for you. I'm so but I got something to say. So I'm like, I need to hear it, mom. Give it to me. What you got to hear? What you got to say? She said, don't give it back. And I was blessed to not give it back, Mike. Became the all-time leading scorer in school's history. And, and the rest is history. I can't imagine he had to do it much. But did Coach Beheim ever get on you? No. Let's, let's get that out the way. Like I said, I've seen him yell. I've seen him run people out of Syracuse and I've seen them run people in, but uh, never had to yell at me. You know, one of the fondest memories I can remember, we will, we will be drawing up, coach will be diagramming a play and, and he will, we run the play and then we would one, two, three cues and we will go out and get on the court and his yelling to me was Lawrence, come here. And I'm like, what's up coach? Just get a bucket, son. I don't care how you do it. So that that's that would be his yell to me, and and I accepted that, and I loved that because it it let me know that you know um, he appreciated what I was doing, and you know if I did it the right way, things would work out well. You know, your sophomore year, the nineteen ninety three season, you guys enter that year knowing that you're banned from postseason play, and actually the season was a you guys were successful, and it was very the successful. championship game is the biggies of the biggies tournament. Absolutely. I was wondering, as a coach again, you know, because this is, you know, we're largely talking about Coach Beheim here. How did Coach Beheim guide you guys through that season to keep you focused and playing at a high level, even when you didn't have that usual goal of making it to the tournament? Yeah, yeah. Of course, that was tough for us at the beginning. But uh, I remember when it first happened, you know, he brought us all in and we had a little team meeting and he just discussed the issues and, and the penalties and what we have to deal with. And uh, uh, we're going to move forward. And, and we did that. We listened to what he had to say. And I remember him saying, you know, it wouldn't be too harsh. I remember him saying it was going to be a smack on the wrist. I kind of remember him saying that. It's just to be a smack on the wrist, Lawrence. Nothing to worry about. People was wondering, was I going to leave or come back or anything? And honestly, you know, it would have been hard to, to leave just after my freshman year that I had, you know, it had been like, you, you're doing yourself a disservice if you try to go to another school when you're averaging 18 to 20 points here at, at, a, at a great college. And I decided to stay. 
and uh, didn't regret it at all. Like you said, we the, the year ended up being solid. And uh, to this day, that's one of the games that irks me the most was the championship game in the Garden of the Big East because I, I wanted that back-to-back, -back, Mike. I wanted that back-to-back. Uh -huh. -back. We wanted my freshman year, and I kind of wanted it again my sophomore year. But um, – and I knew that was our last game of the year. And, and um, it just so happened that uh, it was probably one of the worst games as a team that we played in my four years. But things happened. We, we went to the championship, and uh, – and it was a terrible loss, though. I think 103 to 70, something like that. It was ugly. But we were in the championship. That's the only positive thing I took out of that. It was 103 to 70. <laughs> it amazes me the way, like, the losses stick with you guys. Mm -hmm. And I say you guys, like anybody, you know, that competes to the level that you do. You, I bet if I asked you the winning score of a, of a game you won, you probably would not remember it as well as the loss. Like, and then Jim's yeah. the same way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's this is true. You know, you, you kind of tend to remember uh, the things, you know, the, the bad games because, you know, uh, and, and unless you remember them because it wasn't that many. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, I won a lot of games. I remember, there's a lot of good games that we won. So, of course, you're going to remember the little ones that you lost. Sure. How did Jim handle those losses? Because, you know, what? I remember in your career, your three NCAA tournament appearances, you guys were the toughest out in the history of college basketball. Every single NCAA tournament loss was in overtime. Uh, I thought I was going to, I was going to give you that. I knew that my guy, every game I lost in my career at Syracuse in the tournament was overtime. I knew that. And I don't mean to pick at a, at a wound. I don't, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm honestly, yeah. what I want to know is how did Jim handle that? How did he, you know, approach the team and handle these, Really, some of them were devastating type losses. Yeah. Well, you know what I, I can say about Coach, and that's one other thing I respected about him and, and will always respect about coaches. Uh, he made you feel like a pro when you weren't a pro yet. You know, his his mentality, yeah, a pro, an, an NBA player, a professional. Um, he wasn't one to always be in your face and wondering what you're doing. He would, he would If he told you, that's what he expected, you know. So he 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 had a pro. He kept he when I was in Syracuse, I already felt like I was in the NBA. It's crazy to say, but I already felt like I was in the pros because it was a pro atmosphere. Hmm. And he made it feel like that by um not being all 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 down your back and uh wondering what you're doing. It was like you just got to take care of business. If you take care of business, that's all he was worried about. So I, I respect him for that. Did you notice any changes in him coaching wise over the years? Because you you've you yeah. returned to the Syracuse area. You've been around the program yes. uh in, in, in you know in, in these later years before he yes. retired. Yes. Any changes that you noticed? Yes, absolutely. He's gotten calmer, a little bit more easier to deal with. Uh and another thing I want to get this straight, you know, uh when I played. We didn't play zone all the time. We played man to man, and and we and we pressed, and of course we we sprinkled the zone in there a little bit. But I noticed as the years got past, he started to play the zone more. So if anything, I would um, say I noticed is is um, him playing the zone more, and and you know me being a guy who always. Uh, just looks at things different ways. I tell people, you know, I tell myself, maybe he uh, he was getting a contract under the table to play zone. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never know, though, <laughs> because we could be down 20, Mike. And it was times that, you know, just like switch it up, go full court press and, or, or go some man to man. But he would stay in the zone. And then I think about it and I say, OK, he's wrote books on how to play the zone. He's been on the Olympic team because of the zone. So, yeah, we'll never, we'll never know. Any comparisons you can draw between Coach Beheim and one of your old teammates, Adrian Autry, who is now the, the new coach at Syracuse? <laughs> Any comparisons? 
Uh, not really a comparison, but I can see where Adrian has uh, taken some of his uh, – his 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 coaching style from you know and, and 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 it's only right when you're with someone for 12 14 years however long it's been since he's uh been Adrian's been here coaching you're going to take some of the uh your mentor or your or your head coach's style that was before you and um i i, I can see a little bit if anything i i see uh Adrian is a little bit more uh vocal right now then, then I can remember Coach being at the time. Coach, Coach was kind of wasn't laid back. He, no, by no means necessary. Am I saying Coach was laid back because he wasn't a laid back guy? But you know, uh, Adrian, right now I see more, more energetic and more fire, and that's because he, he maybe he's his first year and he's he's a, he's a rookie coach. You know, I don't I don't know how Coach was his first year, so it might have been the same way. You know, but um. Uh, I, I'm happy for Adrian. Uh, he definitely deserves the opportunity. You know, it's one thing that we're gonna have to give him though is time, right? You know, that's 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 what we truly have to give him is time and understand they're gonna be uh, good times and they're gonna be bad times. But uh, as long as there's more good than bad, you know, they've put they have on the court. He's in the Ring of Honor. They're going to recognize him on Saturday, but what do you do? Short of a statue, right? Yeah, yeah, def absolutely. He's done <laughs> a lot. He's done a lot for uh, Syracuse University, the community, his foundations. And, you know, uh, I tell people, you know, when you think of Syracuse, you know, if you just say that to somebody who's not from here and you say Syracuse, the first two things they think about is Coach Beheim and the Dome. That's that's one of the first things they, they think about that dome first. And then of course Coach Beheim. So he's left his mark here. You know, he's done some great things here for 47 years. Um uh, a lot of wins. Uh I wish he could get that hundred that was hundred games back because he would be on the top of the list right now as we speak if he they didn't snatch that. But uh it happened the way it happened and we're moving forward. But when you think about the arc of his career and even going back to his playing days at Syracuse in the 60s before he became head coach, you know, what, what is Jim Beheim's legacy? Oh, his legacy, you know, hopefully for, 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 the, for the Syracuse natives and the true Syracuse community and the fans here, if anything, he, he's a winner. You know, you can't deny that as much as you might want to or – much as you might say uh, he's not a good coach or he hasn't done this, he hasn't done that, uh, he's a winner. He's like 47 years as a coach. And, you know, let's add five or six more years, almost 50 years just in this university's realm. I, I can't think of one coach or person right now who's been affiliated with the university as long as he has, you know, and, and we're going to um, show him how much we appreciate him and what he's what he has done uh, for the university and the community uh, this Saturday against Notre Dame, and um, uh, kudos to Coach. I have nothing but respect for him. Um, I wish him well on his next endeavor, and uh, that's about it, Mike. Have fun this weekend as you gather with uh, you know, probably a lot of former teammates and other former Syracuse players from throughout the years, and uh, we just appreciate you joining us here as part of this week-long series, looking back on Jim Beheim's career on the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. So thank you again, Lawrence, and we'll see you at the Dome on Saturday. That's right, Mike. Take care, my friend, and it's always good talking to you. Join us next time for the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast, presented by Krauss Health, the exclusive healthcare partner for Syracuse Athletics.